Back when the war in Syria and the refugee crisis were front page news in the West every day, I used to hear about shelling and explosions almost daily. At least there was a period where it was almost daily. For me, the hardest thing um, here in the States was the waiting because you would hear about what was happening. Um, and if you, have, if you have friends, family, loved ones that are living in a war zone, it's really hard to be patient and wait, one, to find out, okay, is it gonna be a good day? What city is it in? Maybe it's a city where I don't know anyone, even though that means that somebody else still is losing everything. And is it, if it's a bad day, is it a city where I do know somebody? And if it is, what neighborhood is it in? Um, and trying to wait for people to be able to get in touch with you and tell you that they're safe. And I think, I mean, I think that experience is pretty universal when any kind of tragedy strikes, that you just wanna hear that your loved ones are safe. So you might think that in that time period where we were hearing about things every day that it would be easier to just turn off the news or just not watch television reports about this kind of stuff. But in reality, for me, I, there was no way that I could do that uh, because, for example, how can I look away when U.S.-led airstrikes are killing hundreds of Syrian civilians? How can I look away when something like the Muslim ban is enacted in this country to prevent people exactly like me and my family from coming to this country where my father, who was born in Syria, is buried literally in the soil of this country that I call home? There's no way for me to ignore any of that so for me, I actually sought out everything that I could read or watch about the war and about the refugee crisis that I could get my hands on. And you know, for me also, when one of my countries was bombing the other one, I felt that the least I could do was not look away, that that was my responsibility. I can't pretend, of course, that my feelings living here in the US as a Syrian American person are anywhere near comparable to what my loved ones that still live in Syria feel or have felt every day for the last seven years living through what's going on, living through the war. And I will never know how they feel. But for me, when I was starting out writing this book and, and actually what, was, what led up to me writing The Map of Salt and Stars was these questions. Um, for me, these questions were things like, what if my father hadn't left Syria for New York? Or what if it were my apartment that was being shelled? Or what if my career aspirations were cut short. My parents, uh, my friend's parents were not coming home anymore because it's very easy for me to imagine that if circumstances had been just a little bit different, I could definitely be in that situation. And I think for me, I'm Syrian American, so this is a connection that I make very readily because I've grown up with a connection to that place. But I think for a lot of Americans who don't have a connection to Syria or to the Middle East in general, or to places that experience war and experience refugee crises and things like this. I think for people, sometimes it can be easier to pretend that civil war or refugee crises are things that happen in other places, that these are things that happen in poor countries with people that they can't relate to or that they would prefer not to relate to. And I mean, I understand that because it's, it's easier to pretend that because once you say, Yes, I can admit that a person, let's say, living in Syria or in another place that's experiencing violence is just like me. That's also to admit that those things could happen to me, right? So I know that that's a hard thing for people to admit to themselves, but I think it's also really important to not look away from the suffering that's happening, not only in Syria, but in, in other places also, because whether we ignore it or whether we pay attention to it, it's still happening. And it, you know, admitting this also means admitting that Syria is a place not very different from America at all. And it's really not. It has modern cities and beautiful landscapes and streets with people coming home from grocery shopping and from work and school kids that are telling each other jokes and counting up their pocket money to buy candy. People are basically the same anywhere. Knowing people who have lived through things like this People talk about the fact that even during a war, for the living, life goes on. Life keeps going on. And people, even in wartime, they try to make beautiful things out of life. They make art, they write stories, they paint paintings, they cook with their families, they laugh and they sing if they can. And 
those things are always happening. And I think that's a beautiful thing because that's a human thing. And so what you hear about is, you know, people aren't on a daily basis. They're thinking about their friends and their homework and reading the latest Harry Potter book, very simple things. And I think also it's, it's good to remember that war makes books into precious objects, not just because they become expensive luxuries, but also because stories give us hope when we feel like we might not have any left. And that's definitely something that's true even for me living here in the States, that's something that I've experienced on my sort of smaller scale also. The fact that I turned to stories not only when I was a kid and I was living through difficult times, but also more recently in 2015, after I left a pretty soul crushing job in academic science, I turned to stories. Um, and that's part of the reason that I wrote The Map of Salt and Stars. And then this past year, when my marriage unraveled, I turned to stories again because making art and also reading and seeing the art of other people made me feel less alone. So I grew up in diaspora in New York City. Um, I'm the child of a Syrian Muslim immigrant father who taught me to take nothing for granted. And that's really present in my sort of family story and my family history. Um, my grandmother, Zainab, who I'm named after partially, um, she actually, from the stories that I've heard, she couldn't read or write. And so to me, I always would really appreciate and, and love these stories of the way that even despite hardship, that she still didn't let that stop her from actually starting a couple of pretty successful businesses. So growing up, I heard nonstop stories about my ancestors, but also about um, the Bilad, the, the land that my father and my family are from. And so hearing these stories about these places that I, you know, maybe hadn't seen with my own eyes, but hearing the stories and seeing the photographs and knowing people even at a distance really meant a lot to me. And it was also really comforting to me because I was growing up in a place that I didn't always feel that I belonged, um, especially growing up as an Arab American in a time when the country that I call home doesn't always want to claim me as being of this place. And so I think growing up in diaspora for me and, and maybe for other people too can often feel like always to some extent thinking of this other place that I'm seeing in stories and in photographs and, and through other people's eyes, but having that place really mean a lot to me and be sort of central to who I am. And for Noor, the 12-year-old protagonist of The Map of Salt and Stars, this is really central to her story. So the basic story of the book is that um, Noor is a Syrian-American girl who was born in Manhattan, like me, um, and she moves back to Syria with her family in 2011 after her father's death. And they move back, unfortunately, right before um, unrest breaks out um, during the, the Syrian civil war and the revolution. And so when they lose their home, they're forced to flee and, and go to first Jordan and then Egypt and across North Africa in search of safety. But the book actually has uh, two timelines. So the other timeline is the story that Noor is telling to herself that her father used to tell her. And it's basically um, sort of a historically inspired fable of this group of medieval map makers that a 16-year-old girl named Rawia from the now Spanish city of Ceuta in North Africa, she apprentices herself to this real 12th century Muslim map maker named Abu Abdullah Muhammad Al Idrisi. And she joins Al Idrisi's group of map makers to map the world, essentially, what was known of the world at that time, in order to save her family from poverty and from hunger. So there's these two stories that are told in parallel. And the thread that connects these two stories, these two timelines in the book, is that both Noor and Rawia are searching for and trying to map in their own way this elusive idea of home and what home means to them. And that's something that, it's a kind of map making that I know how to talk about very well because it's something I've been doing my whole life. And even though I will never ever know what it is hopefully, to be a refugee or to lose my home to war, I do know what it is to seek for happiness in a place where you have to face fear and isolation and rootlessness and violence. And I think that's true not only of me, but for a lot of other people that are growing up in the US too. I think that's something that a lot of people can relate to. So just over a month ago, I got back from living for two months in Morocco in the old Medina of the city of Fez. And 
Fez is a place that I had written about in the map of salt and stars and that was really incredible for me to see because I, I wrote about how 800 years ago it was um, a place of incredible culture and learning and art and scholarship and the fact of the matter is it's still all of those things and it's really thriving especially with artists and with writers and I had the privilege of meeting a lot of, of people who are doing and making these things in Fez. So that was really amazing. And I, it was nice to have the time to, to learn a bit of Darija, which is the Arabic dialect um, that is spoken in Morocco, and to learn how to make a tagine, which I'd like to think is pretty good, but <laughs> I did my best. Um, and just to meet these really incredibly kind-hearted and generous and funny and brilliant people who live in this city that I had the privilege of meeting. Um, and to hear every morning to hear the, the adhan, the call to prayer that woke me up at dawn. And to have all of these experiences of living in an Arab and Muslim country was, was really incredible and important for me as a person as well as as a writer. And also just to have the experience of living in this place where nobody looked at me and saw my face or heard my name and automatically assumed that I was from somewhere else. But what I realized was that living there, even though it was an Arab country and a Muslim country, um, I, I didn't entirely belong there either uh, because growing up, being born and growing up in America has also made me the person that I am today and, and that's just a part of me. And so it might be true that I belong to many places and also not entirely to any place. And I think this is something that when you grow up in diaspora, you have this experience of having these sort of maps through stories and uh, things your family tells you and um, things you've heard maybe secondhand or maybe places that you've visited but you're missing sometimes you can feel like you're missing the the map to the center of you of your identity because you're made up of different places and people and things you're more than one thing especially when you are part of you is from a place that is shredded by war you know that some of these places that are very important to you and central to your identity are places you might never see again. And that can be really hard. When you grow up in diaspora, especially if you are connected to a place that is affected by war, you hold on to what you can. Um, if that's stories or photographs or connections with people that you might only get to speak to every so often or places you only get to visit every so often or not at all, um, you hold on to those things and you kind of use them to make a map of what you know about yourself. But it's, it's hard to do because that central part of you is connected to more than one place. And that map can be very, can be very big, it can be very broad. And sometimes you have to really work at forming it because both displacement and diaspora do force you to make those maps, your own maps of people that you love and places that you might not get the chance to see again. I would really like for this book to start it and continue a discussion and increase empathy for um, Syrians, for refugees, for displaced people in general. And I really hope that it can be maybe a starting point for readers that maybe don't know any Syrians or Syrian Americans or Muslims or refugees in their everyday life Maybe they don't interact with people like that, but that in those cases, maybe they can read this book and feel a bit like, wow, these people are not so different from me at all, because that's the truth. And if that's the case, I hope that that'll also encourage them to use this book as a starting point to then seek out the work of Syrian people, of refugees, of displaced people in their own words, and that they will readers will go and, and read those things also. And I also hope that for people who are like me, people who are Syrian American, who are Arab American, who grew up in diaspora, will be able to pick up this book and say, wow, I can finally maybe see myself. And maybe they haven't seen themselves in literature very many times before. I know when I was growing up, um, it was really hard for me to find representation of myself in literature, to pick up a book by an author and about a character that looked like me or had a name like mine or had experiences like mine or, or shared my faith, those types of things. And I think that can be a really powerful experience. So I hope that if other Syrian Americans pick up this book or other people in, in Syrian diaspora elsewhere in the world 
if they pick up this book, they can be reminded of our heritage and our traditions and our rich um, storytelling traditions and culture and discoveries and imagination and all the things that we can take with us even in this time that is really difficult for people who are in the Syrian diaspora, and especially for people who are now in diaspora because they are refugees. I hope that it can be something that they can take with them and maybe it can bring them a little bit of comfort. But I know that when I was a kid scouring libraries for books that um, made me feel seen, that made me feel less alone, it really meant a lot to me when I was writing this book. Even when it was difficult to write, it helped me to keep going to know that maybe there was a chance that one day a young person or a person of any age really could walk into a library and pick up this book and feel a little bit less alone and feel like they could be the hero of their own story and that their stories matter. That was what kept me going and what really meant a lot to me. I think there's a lot of people, especially young people living in the US right now who can also relate to having to draw your own maps of yourself and of home, especially because we live in a time I mean, and, and maybe there has never been a time when it's not like this, but we definitely live in a time now where families are being split, where there's war, it can feel that war is everywhere, where the uh, way that we define home is challenged every single day, especially if you're living in this country in diaspora or you're an otherwise marginalized person or a person of color. It can feel that it's really difficult to keep defining what home is and hold on to that. And the thing about the map of salt and stars is that both Noor and Rawia um, learn that home is a place you carry with you, that home is in the people that you love, that home is in, in the way that you carry those people in your heart even if you are far away from them or even if you lose them, that they're still a part of you and that that can be your home, that people can be your home. And for me this has definitely also been the case, that home is in the people who love me. It's in my family and not just in blood family but in chosen family too. And that because of the strength of the people who love me, I always know who I am and where my home is, no matter how far the distance is between us on a map.